Okay, great. I think we're on. Um, hi, everybody. It's Tay. Welcome back to one of our other podcast shows. As you guys may have noticed, it's a very casual show. Nothing is edited. Nothing is filtered out. It's just a raw conversation between me and our guests. And we're really hoping something good comes from it. And today, I am very excited because we have Randy here, who is our death doula teacher. She is amazing. I I read a book about death doula, like a death doula book years ago, and it was such an amazing book. It looks at death in such a unique perspective, which I think is refreshing and what everybody needs now. It's talking about death is very taboo, but it's so important. And to have Randy here with us today to not only educate everybody, but kind of dive into a little bit more of the, the touchy topics on, you know, a death doula course and what it means to be a death doula. I think is so special. Uh, I think everybody is going to love you, Randy. You just, as you said, before we started recording, you have an amazing energy. I just love the course. Um, yeah, I'm just really thrilled to have you here. So I'll just let you do your own intro here and then I'll fire off some questions. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you so, so much, first of all, for having me. Um, it's been amazing to work with you guys. So um, I love being here. My name is Randy um, for everybody who I haven't met yet who's watching this. And I am a certified death doula. Um, I teach the death doula course with my um, business partner within the school section of it, um, not within myself going out to see clients. Um, and I'm a certified death doula, but I call myself a certified uh, life and death doula because I'm really passionate about life and living. And I really think that's what a death doula is all about. Um, I'm a mother and I, I'm a sister and I, yeah. And I just, I find that there's a lot of magic in life and I think there's a lot of beauty in life. And um, so officially I'm a certified death doula. I run the Ontario School of Energy and that's where we have our death doula program. Um, and it's been amazing. I, I, I really love it. I love all about it. And, and that's a little bit about me. <laughs> and I love it too. Big fan, <laughs> big fan. <laughs> um, maybe you could just tell our audience a little bit of what we dive into within the course, like what it means to be a death doula, because I feel like the name itself, and as you and I were discussing before the recording, the name itself is very daunting to people. And I think it's really important to kind of educate people that it's not supposed to be a scary thing. It's supposed to be something that you tap into and you listen to and you guide people through. So could you just give us a bit of clarification on the role itself, but also the, the name as well? So um, a death doula is a person, man or woman, who advocates for, uh, educates someone on and empowers somebody um, who is moving through the dying process or maybe a grieving friend or family member. They're, they're advocating, empowering and educating them. Um, but it could be anybody at any stage of their life who wants to talk about death and dying. And people are like, why would you want to talk about death and dying? Like, why would you want to do that? Um, and death is the only thing in our entire life that we have a guaranteed ticket to. Like we are going to be there one day. We don't know if we'll get married. We don't know if we'll have children. Um, we don't know, you know, what sort of jobs and life paths we will take, but in the, in the end, cause I don't think if there's a, a permanent end, but in the end, we all will be facing death. Um, and I wrestled a lot with my name, with the title of death doula. I thought I could call myself an end of life doula. Um, I could leave the word doula out because a lot of people immediately think of that as a, somebody who brings people into this world, which it is. Um, but I realized by my own reactions, when I thought of death doula, I thought, Ooh, I don't know how that will sit with people. And I thought, well, maybe that's why I should pick death doula. Um, and that's exactly why I did it. I think that there's a big, um, taboo around death and dying and talking about it. And when we watch movies and we watch television shows and there's funerals and people dying, um, everybody's dressed in black and it's a very, very upsetting thing. And it's very, very dark. And, um, it's looked at as painful and morbid. And, um, to me, that's exactly why I chose the name death doula. 
I tell people I'm a death doula and immediately they're like, you're what? So immediately they want to know what it is. Um, and then I often get, well, that's a really morbid name. And I think that's exactly why I chose it. We are all alive. We're all going to die. Our loved ones are all going to die. So why shouldn't we get comfortable with it? Um, it's a part of life and it can be a, a very beautiful part of life. I love that. I just, like I said, I read the book years ago and then as a PSW, um, working through different work settings, I really noticed a need for us to kind of address the topic of death and yeah. it's almost become like a social norm to tiptoe around it, not bring it up. You know, if somebody brings it up in conversation, it's always like, Oh, don't say that. Or let's not think about that. Let's not do that. And like, while I do understand, you know, it is, it's sad. It is like a sad concept for people as well. I find that once we get there, once we get to that point, I've seen so many, you know, families and patients um, get to the point and nobody knows what to do. And yeah. I think it also contributes to this whole other level of anxiety within family members and even the patients themselves where nobody knows what they're going to do. And it's almost like this pressure that you have to handle death, right? And I yes. don't really feel like there's a way to handle death, right? There's no textbook. So having yeah. someone like a death doula to kind of be in your corner the whole time through the process, yeah. it's just so important. And it really helps to, um, I don't know the word that I'm thinking of right now, but to kind of ease not only the patient, but the family into this whole process smoothly. It's, so it's not more of like a, you know, white knuckling. I'm so, I'm, I'm so scared to do the wrong thing. You know, it's just something that can be kind of calm and in a way nice, like a nice death, which I know is such a weird thing to say, but you probably get it too. And I know a lot of us in the healthcare field know exactly what I'm talking about. There's like good death and there's death. That's just like, ah, it's yeah. all, ugh, but you know what I mean? It's just, there's a different way of handling it. And I think because of the way we've been conditioned, we've, a lot of us are very underprepared for, for what is inevitable. So I'm so excited that you're here. <laughs> I'm so excited about the name too. I mean, it is, it's just so important and yeah, I've seen it a lot too. The whole, don't talk about death, death doula. And it's just like, yeah, like blow it open, blow it up. Like, let's talk about it. So I've always been somebody who didn't tiptoe into things. I was kind of like, I'm going to shake everything up. And I've lived that way my whole <laughs> life. I feel like I'm shaking up death in a way, but in a really good way, I think it's necessary. Um, this is something we need to evolve with. We evolve in every other area. So, you know, it's natural that death would follow suit. So there's just so many ways of doing it too, that I don't know if people really even realize, even I didn't like not that I'm a pro or anything, but like, I didn't realize there's so many things that you can do and it's whatever you want it to be. You know what I mean? I think there's also this way that we've kind of been, you know, constructing death, constructing end of life. And it's, you know, it's almost textbook and it's like, it really doesn't have to be, it's your experience. And again, just having someone in your corner advocating for you while you were going through, you know, the different transitions is just so important because it just really can create either a good experience or a really bad experience. And just for myself, from what I've noticed, I mean, I've seen different stages of end of life, but I found, especially when I worked in ICU, it was a lot of end of life, but it was yes. a lot of like, I saw a lot of under preparedness, which is fair too. I mean, I'm not bashing anybody because I totally get it. And things just happen out of the blue. You don't know what to do, but a lot of it, I find people just are clutching and trying to do the best that they can. And they don't know what the best is because no one talks about it. <laughs> so that will spend like years planning a wedding or like planning a really big event. And unless, you know, it's like a child or somebody who dies or an infant very early, mm -hmm. um, that really have our entire lives that we know this event's coming and we're like, we'll just wing it when we get there. And, uh, and I think that's where we're having a lot of missteps. You know, we'll plan for things that we don't even know are going to happen, but um, we have a whole life that we could plan for this. So why not just take a little bit of that time and, and do that? So 
I like the way that you you phrase that as well because it is I mean it would it's sad and it's it's weird kind of planning your own end of life ritual yeah. situation and it's a very weird experience but yeah. the way you kind of word and you phrase things and I've even noticed this in your course as well it's like a it's a very gentle process and you're kind of allowing the person to feel whatever they need to feel in that moment and then you're moving along so that things are kind of you're not it's not like a it's not like a dwelling thing but it's like a if you need to feel sad right now you feel sad and I'm here for you through that and that's also I guess part of the job as well as a death doula um yeah. so I really like the whole the gentle approach to it all and even just listening to your courses I know for a lot of us out there signing up for a course right now sounds daunting I know for me too I I don't love school <laughs> like I just <laughs> don't love school but I love learning and I love yeah. asking questions and I'm more of a hands-on person but a, the concept of like a textbook and being in class like oh no just turns me away but yeah. I did want to say for our viewers I really like the way that you organize your course and your class and it's very um it's easy I just put the course on um for those of you that don't know Randy does videos online and you basically tune into the videos when it fits and suits your schedule and then you can do whatever you want with your classroom on the background and it's almost like a podcast but it's the course and it's so yeah. easy for people you know like me that just want to listen in but without all the pressure of sitting there and writing stuff down and, and things like that that sometimes will deter you away from a course in general so I would say if anybody is interested in actually taking the course, it's not as intense as it sounds like it's intense. Like you need to listen and do your coursework and all of that stuff, but it's not as inaccessible as it sounds. It's not, uh, it's very much based upon your schedule. So I just wanted to address that too, because we've had a lot of questions about the death doula course. And while I love having you on here for clarity, I want to also tell the audience as a student in your course myself, that it's not as crazy as you may think and I just I also appreciate that with you as well you're gentle with your students as well and it's very much like if you miss the course today it's not a big deal and it's it's really yeah. nice to just know that I can click on it when I have time and nobody's pressuring me <laughs> and you know what you. It shows, um it shows us who's watched it so say you know and there's no time frame so if somebody needs longer to I have students who sometimes don't write their exam for like three months after the course is done because they're so busy and they haven't had time to sit and study. By the way, the exam is all open book. So there's no pressure. You have all the answers, but, um, you know, so it's very much, you can go at your own pace. So if someone's like, oh, you know, I've completed everything. I can see if you've watched those videos. <laughs> <laughs> and so I've never had like, well, you know, like I've never had anyone not watch them, but uh, it's nice because I never worry about if someone's like, oh, I couldn't get there today. I'm like, it's fine. Like, I'll see whenever you watch it, it'll show me. So it's, it's never a big deal. I love that. It's not that common that people are very like relaxed like that. It's really nice. And it just makes you feel like you can learn at your own pace. And it's just so good. It's so good for people like me that, you know, the pressure of the textbook in the classroom, I'm almost like, oh no, like I no no. But I'm yeah. so excited about it. So it's really great. I just, yeah, I wanted to point that out to you. It's just not a common practice that a lot of people do. And I really think that you, you really did something there, you know? So um, I know that you also have a presentation for us as well to kind of yeah. this and give us a bit of background. Um, yeah. Are you able to share your screen? If they um, give you that option, I thought I gave you that option here. For those of you just listening to the audio here, Randy and I are on Zoom. And if you are interested in watching the video, we will be posting the Zoom video as well to our social media platforms. But for now, yeah. if you're listening to the audio, you might just be listening, but there is a full presentation that should be accessible to you as well. So when you said presentation, I thought you meant, because leading up in a little bit, I'll be doing a, present, uh, a different presentation. Mm -hmm. um, so for that I do, but for today I just have notes that I'm I'm gonna chat about. Sorry. <laughs> oh gosh, no, that's actually amazing because I was just thinking in my brain. I was like, what if it doesn't work? And now like, yeah, no worry. 
Bye. Bye. Bye to the whole video. <laughs> no, that's great. Okay. So just kidding, everyone. Um, Randy's <laughs> going to talk and that's great because nothing can go wrong. <laughs> okay. Um, take it away, please. Well, thank you. Um, so I'll start, I guess, with why I became a death doula myself and how that sort of entered my world. Um, so when I was a child, uh, like around two years old, I had a very strange experience with death, I guess. And I went up to my mom and I told her that I used to be a little boy who was hit by a truck and I died. And then I walked away and, um, she wow. didn't really know what to do. She's like, okay. Um, and just ignored it because I was born in 1986 and there was not a lot of people talking about this in the eighties. And I think I was about two years old. So 1988, um, and then I always had weird connections and experiences. I heard a lot of voices when I was a kid and I went for all kinds of like schizophrenia testing, mental, mental health testing. And, um, they couldn't explain it. They were like, she's connecting to something that we don't really know. And, um, that was that. And then move forward. I was 16 years old and my sister passed away and we were best friends, um, and that rocked my world. And I remember going into the hospital and I can still hear my mom, you know, screaming and she dropped to the ground and my sister started crying and everyone in the room was crying. And I was extremely sad, but I could feel this, this energy in the room or this, there was something very magical happening that I couldn't ignore at the same time. And I just went over to her. She was already gone. Um, and I just held her hand though. I felt this connection to just want to be with her, even though she, I just felt like she was still transitioning and I needed to be there to help her. And I was 16 years old. She was um, 24. I had no experience with death and dying. Um, and then they gave us a few minutes and we're like, okay, you need to move along. Like not, they weren't trying to be, um, upsetting or anything but you know there's a lot of people who are coming in and dying so you do have to move along so they put us into this room and I still remember the the carpet was this burgundy color um and I remember it because I just sat there staring at the carpet my whole family just stared down like we didn't know what to do and there wasn't anybody there my sister died on a Sunday and they said well we we have people who come in sometimes to talk to the families but they don't they don't work on the weekends and my mom said, oh, well, I guess you don't die on a Sunday then. And she didn't mean it to be mean, but your grief does strange things. So I knew that it just didn't feel right. Um, and so I, I, that really affected me. And then my grandmother died and there was other deaths in the family. And my mom said to me, you, you handle death really well. I think you need to be the person to speak at, at your grandmother's funeral. And I'm like, I hate public speaking. I, I did. I really did not like talking in front of people. Um, but I went up there and did it and I felt so good. Um, I could feel every memory that I spoke about, uh, that my grandma lived through and I, I was able to get through it without crying. And I, not that crying is a bad thing. Um, it shows our emotions, but there was something in me that was able to take all that emotion and put it into my words instead of into my tears, which was really powerful. Um, so after that happened, I kept um, having all these like signs and things coming around me and, and I was ignoring it. Like, I don't like death. I don't want to talk about it. I don't want to talk about my sister dying. Um, and then finally, I seen a course actually that um, was for death doula. And I thought, maybe I'll just take this course and just see what it's about. And I completely fell in love with everything that a death doula encompasses. And um, I didn't feel like really prepared after that course. Um, and that was a few years ago. And it's such a new industry that um, it was nothing against them. I just felt that there was a lot more that we could incorporate. Um, so I start, really, really started to look at things. And within hospice, uh, there is an idea of whole person care. And whole person care is not happening if we are not taking into account spiritual needs, energetic needs, um, values, beliefs, just things these people believe in that they grew up their whole life living their life by that way. 
um, it's, it's almost like, we're just like, okay, medically you need this physically, this will get you to here. Um, and then you'll go, but it's like, you know, some of these people, um, were very, very religious and maybe they grew up, you know, that, um, certain things had to happen or they weren't going to get to a final resting place. Um, or maybe they grew up in sort of a Wiccan family where everything was done very holistic and very outdoors. And now they're sort of in this starch white hospital room and nothing is holistic. Um, and so I, I am not going to say which, you know, I believe, um, because it doesn't matter. I'm not here to, to tell any, to, to push my beliefs on any of these people. Um, but I'm here to help them continue in their beliefs and to continue exploring, um, that. So that's kind of what led me into becoming a death doula. And, um, I just put it out there one day on my Facebook that I'd finished the course and a friend of mine, and this is why I say to people, we don't talk about what we're going through. And I knew this girl very well. And she said, I need to hire you. And, and she told me, she gave me permission to, to use her story. I said, Laura, I, why do you need me? And she said, I'm dying. And like, it hit me like a ton of bricks. And I thought, we don't talk about what we're going through. We don't talk about grief. We don't talk about death. There's something in life where we're just supposed to act like everything's okay all the time, but that's not, that's not true. That's not honest. <laughs> um, so all of that combined made me realize we need to do something more. We need to help these people. Um, when my grandmother was in the hospital, every time she like made a noise, the nurses were like pumping more fentanyl into, I think it was an IV drip. I didn't know then what I know now that a noise doesn't mean pain. Um, I think that death, it can be, the pain can be managed holistically in a way that we are still experiencing the last of our physical experiences. And um, I think that's so important. And I wish I could have saved my grandma from that and other people. I met a nurse a few weekends ago and she said, yeah, we call that numbing them out. And she said, I don't like it. I don't like it. And I want to take your course because I think we need to do this better. So that is uh, what led me into this life path. And it just continues to evolve. Um, I just wanted to briefly mention, if I could, I do mention this in the course, um, the reason why it's so important that we look at death and dying. I get a lot of people who who hop onto my social media pages and they're like, people have been dying for since the beginning of time. We don't need somebody to help us die. And it's true. We don't need someone to help us die. We've been giving birth since the beginning of time. So I guess we don't technically need someone right to help us give birth. But when we have help and we have assistance, more hands makes lighter work, right? It makes things easier and we can really um, listen and be more compassionate. So I just wanted to, to touch base on, um, so nine out of 10 uh, people felt that doctors should discuss end of life care choices. And eight out of 10 people said they would be very comfortable talking to their doctors, their family doctors about what they want at the end of their life. But in that same study, only two out of 10 people actually had conversations with people providing medical care to them. Um, you know, that they even had end of life directives. Only two out of 10 actually had those conversations. Um, and even when patients have, you know, decided what they want, they have their advanced care directives uh, written out. Often only one out of four doctors even know that their patients have them. So a lot of times they're just going to the hospital um, or they have them and they're made and they're put in a file um, and the doctor doesn't open it. It's very rare that we die with our family doctor bedside with us. You know, um, we may have a, a home care nurse or PSW or um, like family and friends, or it, it could have been a car accident, like where nobody was, you know, there. So um, I think it's really important that we have somebody like ourselves making sure that these happen. Um, if someone doesn't want to be resuscitated, we don't, but it goes so much more beyond that. Um, if they only want aromatherapy care, we do that. If they want to have 
um, specific rituals and things done in the room as they're dying, you know, anything that becomes this advanced care um, where it, it surrounds, you know, a life or death situation. It's, imp- it's, it's really good that the medical mode of care is to keep people alive at all costs, but that's only if that's their choice. They may not want that. And um, yeah, a- another quick point to mention on is that 80% of people say they would prefer to die at home, um, but less than 20% die at home, 60% die in the hospital and another 20% die in nursing homes. And um, for example, I know a family who's during COVID, um, they needed a, the ventilator, the hospital did. And they said to the mother, you know, we need the, the ventilator now, you can't live on it. And that to me was just heart wrenching. Like, how can you just basically give someone an end date and um, to save someone else's life? But at the same time, I understand the, the why it's so necessary. So the mother made her own choice. She said, I'm going to go off the ventilator. I want to save someone else. I'm 85 years old. I've lived a really great, really long life. And um, it was her daughters that I ended up having to work more with because they were so angry and they couldn't understand you know, why their mother had chosen that and why the hospital wanted this. And um, so having someone there like myself to help them explore why they were so upset, to help explore why we needed the ventilator, to help get the things um, that they needed. So when the mother made her decision, you know, she had everything around her that she wanted. Um, And I just know that years ago, it sometimes that option wasn't even given. It was just, we're taking this now. You don't get to say goodbye. You don't get to, I had to sort of advocate. I had to stay in the room and kind of make sure that everything, everyone got to say their goodbyes. Everything was done properly. Um, And it's not that nurses and doctors um, and PSWs and anybody like that is, is incompassionate. Um, It's just that when there's so much death that you're working with, um, it does start to be become a number, which is another reason that I think it's really great. We have courses like this because it's a refresher for our brain where we're like, this is someone's grandma. This is someone's mom. This is someone's daughter or brother, or like somebody loves this person. And even if this doesn't directly affect our, my family or my relationships, um, I can be that bridge and I can be that support for the people it is affecting. So, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I'm just sitting here. I'm trying to let you speak, but I'm like, yes, yes. <laughs> I like, muted yeah. myself. I was like, let her go, let her go. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was so beautiful. Like, thank you for including us in your story too. I mean, and I think these are the things that people don't realize and the perspectives that aren't really tapped into because some of us have never had to tap into them. And it's like, what you're saying too, it's all true. And it's all, it's just, it seems like some, somewhere along the line, we've almost created this textbook on how death should be handled and how you die. And it's very clinical sometimes. And it's like, when did that become the only option? And it's just so nice to shake your head for a second and realize there's different avenues and you are in total control of it. You don't have to sign up for half of the things that you're signing up for. And you can basically take control of the own, like the way that you leave this earth and that in of itself is empowering and almost brings a sense of security. Whereas we've kind of glazed that over and we've kind of, I don't know what it is too. Like we try to preserve human life for as long as possible, even if it doesn't benefit the person going through it. And it's just like a huge topic in and of itself, but it's just, yeah, it's just really, it's heartwarming in a way to kind of hear what you have to say, but also how important the death doula role is just because of all of the things that you just, you just said. And yeah. uh, like you're, when you were talking about the, the passing of your sister and your mom yeah. said, you know, I guess it's you know, can't die on a Sunday, which yeah. I mean, yeah, like that's grief. Obviously she's angry, but she is, you have every right to be, because it's almost like if you do die on a Sunday or a Saturday, oh, no support. Sorry. 
And it's like, when did this become so textbook and so structured that we're basically leaving people, you know, throwing people out there to kind of figure it out for themselves. And that's where it becomes so complicated too. It's just, yeah. Yeah, there's just so many things, right? And I'm sure you can agree, like the systemic issues that we have, and it just helps address a lot of things. People don't realize that the rule is just so integral. It's just not talked about enough even. Yeah, it's so big and um, it, it's only going to get bigger. I mean, hospice started, uh, I don't, I can't even think of the exact date off the top of my head, but we'll say like, however many years ago, it wasn't very long, um, but we're hitting the age of baby boomers and not just baby boomers, but in general, the population on the planet is bigger. And um, we know, you know, that there's a lot of understaffed hospitals and uh, retirement centers and things like that. And especially going through COVID, you know, I think we have, it's even more understaffed than it was before. And um, we need people to help those people who are working their butts off, who are exhausted, who, you know, maybe are making choices they wouldn't, maybe a nurse is doing something she wouldn't without even realizing it because she's run off her feet. I mean, I don't think that there's, um, I don't think that we can really blame anybody except for the fear that we have in ourselves of, of not wanting to talk about it because it is sad and it is painful but um it, it's changed it's for me it's changed um even with my own family members and things like that when they pass away it's still sad but I can feel this beauty that's with it and I feel really happy for their soul. Uh, it's really, really sad for everybody else left behind. But um, I can attest that talking about it every day and living this life um, has made me so comfortable with it. And I so appreciate every moment I have um, being alive now because I talk about it so much. So I think um, there's just so much goodness that this position can bring for people that we're helping, but for myself, I mean, every single person that I help, um, that it, it's also therapeutic for my own thoughts about death and my own feelings about death. Um, so it's a really cool cycle where we're all sort of helping each other. Yes. I've noticed that too. It's just, there's so many different ways. And as a PSW too, this course, it's just like another thing to add to your toolbox. And like, for me personally, I'm not like, I didn't know how spiritual this would all get to. And like, I like to keep an open mind as well, but I don't know enough about spirituality and all of that other stuff that's involved. And it's not always about that either. Like, I think too, a lot of people sort of associate the two and it's like, yeah. Oh, I have to be like super spiritual. And it's like, no, you just have to be kind of open to what your client wants and willing yeah. to abide by that. And, you know, just be open to things, but you realize how, good and how much that does for someone when you are more like that and when we do take a more of a sort of a liberal approach to this to the whole death and dying situation instead of coming at it from a clinical sterile perspective where it's like yeah if you don't fit x y and z like sorry tough luck it's just yeah, yeah. and I don't know why but like we are just like that and I just like you said the more that you talk about it it becomes a little bit easier and it's just hard for all of us, I think. So hopefully that shift comes a little bit more, but yeah, it's so important. I just, oh, I love talking <laughs> about it. It's, I, it's so nice. I'm sorry. It's so refreshing. You know what I mean? Because we all get stuck in our own little boxes, myself included. And then you sit yeah. down and you have these really refreshing conversations with open-minded people that just come at you with a new perspective and like a new energy. And it's just like, like mind blown, like, yeah, yeah, I can incorporate this into my job as a PSW. Oh, I can incorporate this into my job as a friend, a caregiver, anything really like anybody can do it. And it's just, yes, it just, it just does so much. Yeah. I think, um, like we strive for only good times in our lives, which of course, you know, we only want to feel good times, but I think people real like don't realize when we run from like the not so good times it makes them worse 
if we like are like, hey, old friend, this is a sad time and we make peace with that, it really becomes a little bit less sad. Um, death is still very, very heavy and very sad, but yeah, it's a different. And when you think back on your memories of your loved ones, especially for people who worked with the death doula, their memories are going to be that they sat and went for tea, you know, with their grandmother, and then they knitted something and they went for a walk. Their, their memories aren't going to be sitting there saying, okay, um, we need to plan grandma's funeral and we need to do this. Like they can just say, you know, we want this, this, and this, I can do the groundwork or, or whomever, um, if that's what someone chooses to offer. Right. Mm -hmm. And, uh, it, it really allows <clears throat> the family to have family time and, and not to have all of this this planning and, and all of that. Um, and that's why it's so good. I think, uh, for PSWs, especially, um, taking the course because it allows for them to sort of, of not that they would be planning, um, funerals or maybe they would, if they're going to offer that, you know, on the side or something, but, um, maybe it just offers or helps them to give a bit more of a safe space for their clients to be vulnerable in talking about those things. Maybe. Oh, we froze a little bit. Oh no, my screen is frozen. I will just wait. I think you're looking. I... Sorry, everybody. If the audio got weird on you, that's because my computer got weird on me. So I had to pause it for a second. But basically, we're going to do a part two with Randy outlining the day in the life of a death doula and kind of talking about the role more as in like what you're doing, what your job is. Um, so please tune in for our next episode. Thank you, Randy, for even just coming today and talking with me. And it's been so good. It's been so good that we've just decided to make a part two because we can't <laughs> stop. <laughs> and it's so great. Um, so yeah, thank you for being here with me today. Um, please stay tuned for part two. We will be discussing the role a little bit more in depth um, yep. when my computer decides to behave itself. So thank you, Randy, for being on the show with us. Thank you. Okay. Bye, everybody. Bye.